So there's three sections, but we're going to focus on the two mainly today. And the first is the design perspective. So we wanted it. Um, so there's a piece written by a student on, on her opinion, um, and then an instructional design perspective. And then we have a, an instructor perspective on how and why the design is the way that she recommends. Um, and then we have a bunch of exemplars. So as Joanne mentioned, um, we knew that we wanted something that we could point to and make it really easy um, for people to kind of reduce the barrier to try these new things. Um, so sometimes it's completely overwhelming to redesign your old course, especially after the last three years where we've been thrown into turmoil and tried to do, <laughs> a lot of people have tried a lot of new things. Um, and so we wanted to kind of simplify that, um, that risk for people to, to do things. So on the next slide, um, I wanted to show uh, yeah, the student perspective. So I have to give a shout out to Sevda. Um, she writes this really beautiful piece. It's quite hilarious. When we told her the topic was we wanted to talk beyond exam and we wanted a toolkit or a guidebook, um, she really thought, you know what, like we should make it like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but like the Hitchhiker's Guide to Alternate Assessments. And so she wrote this pretty funny, um, you know, piece about how, um, you know, the traditional exam hasn't really worked for her as a learner. It's not been something that she's found um, has really resonated. It didn't really, she didn't feel like it was measuring as well as it could. And so um, she talks about Professor Rex, uh, P. Rex, who marking up the exam with a red pen. Um, and so a lot of the theme, um, at least the aesthetic of the book, it was thanks to the student perspective, but it was really helpful to have that uh, that viewpoint. Um, to know that when we're designing, we're thinking about students in mind. And then the next perspective is sort of the work that Joanne and I do is that we work with faculty and we want to bring this um, idea of what, what are you trying to accomplish with the assessment? What is the course about? What are your main learning outcomes? And often, you know, we hear people say that they want them to students to analyze and evaluate and create, um, but the assessments don't have a constructive alignment. They're not actually measuring what you hope to be measuring. And so a lot of the things are kind of in that area of remembering. And trust me, remembering is very important Important. There is a place for us to be able to ensure that we have recall, but it's a foundational piece and it's not the only thing. So can we look um, beyond and provide these other um, ways? So um, the team, uh, one of uh, Joanne's great team members created this lovely infographic, which I just adore. So I wanted to include that, but that's in the book and talking about um, how you can think design with Bloom's taxonomy in mind. And each of the exemplars are... Um, are, are focusing and telling us where, where we're kind of trying to aim. And so, um, and that leads us to the instructor perspective. We had the pleasure of working with Dr. Maureen Connolly. If you haven't met Maureen, um, then, you know, she's, she's just pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, she's, she is amazing. And so um, I'm going to summarize it with just these three words. This is what Maureen would say is do less better. She is, uh, she was our former director in our Center for Pedagogical Innovation, um, but she's also a 3M fellow, and she teaches almost in every department at Brock. I think she's cross-listed in women and gender studies and kinesiology and education and child and youth studies, and so she has this wealth of experience in teaching, and so she um, came to it from, you know, from how she designs her courses, and she, we were lucky enough for her to do a section um, in the book on her perspective of how she designs um, and her her kind of mantra, we, we run 12 week courses here um, at Brock. And so her mantra was after week eight, consolidate. Um, or if you're three quarters of the way through, uh, how does it go? Um, anyway, the, the main idea is that um, in the last quarter of the course, that's when you should sort of be doing your culminating learning. Um, and because we tend to try and cram so much in um, because we think that there's all this content, but we actually know that students can't, it's, it, there's the temporal limitation of a 12 week course. They're not actually able to use um, uh, or, or utilize that um, time efficiently. So I kind of tried to Gantt chart this on the next screen. Um, and so all these yellow dots are where Maureen does assessments. And so she spends the first bit of her course, you know, active introducing and activating prior learning and also doing a lot of formative feedback. So she's um, she's finding out where her students are. Um, so finding out what they know already. Um, so we have often you'll come into a course and you have an expectation that if they've taken these 
courses that are at this place, but not everybody comes through a through their degree pathway the same. And so she spends a bit of time doing that formative assessment. And then, uh, then she's, that's when the core of the new content um, happens and she's connecting it to prior learning. And she builds it, the chapter talks about how she builds this around threshold concepts, um, which are these really, um, challenging things that in every discipline there's sort of this challenging thing that is so difficult to understand and so building that pathway to understanding it um, really requires this thoughtful approach um, and then she doesn't want to introduce new content she wants you to actually to worry about in that those last few weeks um, this has been a hard sell for me I will admit um, other than Maureen I haven't convinced too many people to spend those, that many weeks consolidating um, but at least a, a couple of weeks at the end is when you should really be tying it together and bring it together and, and hopefully bridging off into the next thing and so she spends a lot of that time working on the assessment um, talking about application and real world problem solving and so on the next slide you'll see that this is all taking the universal design for learning approach I just saw somebody saying that there was a UDL fellows program which sounds amazing we should always we should have those right across uh, Canada that's it's a great idea this is a, a drawing that I did um, for a, a universal design for learning project and it, it kind of summarizes the way that Maureen does her project so she has like these frequent low stakes assessments that are kind of uh, designed for reflection and uh, determining where the learning is um, the learning is chunked um, and and then are there towards this learning goal um, and so um, universal design for learning is is something that we're always working on and we really did try and build it into this um, resource as well um, the next slide takes us to oh yeah the exemplar so let's I kind of there's a lot of them there's there's a ton so I just wanted to kind of give you a big uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of my favorite ones um, so if we go to the next one um, each one includes you know the blooms level it includes um, a description and some fills, uh, facilitation tips and the criteria this is the big thing because once you take a step away from um, you know right or wrong answers um, it gets a little more challenging on how you know whether this is, you know, what what grade do I give this project? And so each of these exemplars come with some criteria and so um, and, and, a, and a kind of a framework or a rubric that you can consider how you would do some grading. So it, it just some guidance for you. And then we have some student examples, which I'm going to show a couple of those uh, moving forward. This is another one of my favorite ones. Um, this is a lot of stuff, but I wanted to show you one of this is a student example for a rec recreation and leisure course that um, we had a prof here. Um, it, she removed because it was a course that had been put online. This was pre pandemic um, and she didn't want to do the online exam. And so she did it as a mind map of final assignment. So this this has an accompanying reflection paper that I have to write, but this allows them to really think about um, what they know. Um, and what they can do in, in a different way other than the assessment, um, than the exam. And uh, she, the students loved it. She found it so much more interesting um, instead of the typical approach. And so we, there's a couple other examples on the mind map page as well. And then there's some examples of how you could do the, the criteria or the rubric. Um, and I just wanted to like put that on a slide so you could see what that looks like. Another one of my favorite ones is the podcast podcasts are really popular um and so uh we have a lot of people doing podcasts now I think also in the last couple of years they've just they just sort of taken off um and I guess I want to like drive home again this idea about universal design is that it allows um multiple ways of showing and doing so some some people and I'll show it coming up don't um, say that it must be done a certain way is as you're providing these choice and options. Um, so maybe this is one of the other options for assignments. Um, uh, so going into the next um, example, yeah, so the multimodal culminating project actually includes multiple options. So kind of all of the above. Um, you can do it as a video, you can do a podcast, you can do an infographic, and it's looking at, um, you know, maximizing student choice, but still having really clear criteria about what, what is the, the learning goal, what are we trying to accomplish with this assessment. I'm just looking at the chat about um, the, the, 
the criticisms about universal design, and I have read that um, with the academic ableism, it's a really interesting point. And I think we have to be careful to not put all our eggs in that the one basket. So, but it, I think it's a helpful framework for us to think at least about allowing students to demonstrate their learning in multiple ways uh, through action and expression, and for us to be showing things in multiple ways. So, um, but it, it's a fair, it's a really fair comment. That's another workshop that I would love to go to. <laughs> but the book is really good. Jay Jay Dalmage on academic ableism. He really talks about um, how we can't put all of our hopes into universal design for learning. But it is something that is really important to keep in mind if you're not even at that point yet. So, um, on the next slide. Oh, lift off. Okay, this. <laughs> This is the fun part. <laughs> yeah, so now that we've gone through a few of the examples, and I just wanted to mention, because the last example, both the multimodal going back, um, was a course that we taught at McMaster. And one of the things that we did with that particular project, and it's and the reason that I like it, I'm glad that you selected it, Julie, as one of the exemplars, is um, we scaffold the learning throughout the course. So when you th think about what Maureen had indicated about after week eight consolidate this, it really we really did do that in this course so after week eight was when the students were putting together their projects but all along in the first eight weeks they were you know suggesting their project topic mapping out their project scripting some of the videos that they had so they were there was the scaffolding going on that led up to this and really helped um in the understanding of what the final assignment was meant to be so 